All right, we begin unit four. Um, a couple of announcements. One, let's not forget, in class exam, right after spring break. So it's two weeks from this Wednesday. Um, if you're planning on coming back from spring break late, I know it happens. Um, don't miss that Wednesday. That's going to be here in class. I'm not sure what the date is, but it's exactly two weeks from Wednesday, and that will be on units three and units four. Um, I have, because of the timing of all of this, decided rather than having you write a movie review over spring break, I've pushed it another week later. It was originally due on the 15th. It is now due on the 22nd, March 22nd, and that assignment is now available up on Carmen. Um, that's going to be to watch the movie Dr. Strangelove. Anybody here watch the movie Dr. Strangelove? Stanley Kubrick? Anybody like movies? Stanley Kubrick's a great director. This is his first writing, directing, and producing debut. It's a satire about nuclear war. Um, and it's actually, if you watch it with the right light, I've watched it with undergraduates in a big auditorium and nobody laughs but me. But it is really actually very funny, but it's funny in a really darkly humorous way. Um, and so I encourage you to look out for that. Last but not least, <clears throat> I think I promised an online discussion with our TA. It was supposed to get up last Friday. Things in Columbus got a little wonky. So she is, while we're speaking, recording that piece. We hope to have it up tonight. Um, if not, it'll be up sometime tomorrow. That is going to be a discussion that is to help you synthesize. I think she's just doing unit three in that, and then she's going to try to get a unit four in before the exam. And what she's done is she's watched the lectures, she sat down and talked with me, and she's put together a, well, so as a student, here's how I might help you think about tying this stuff together to sort of help you synthesize some of this because we don't do a lot of synthesis and we don't do a lot of discussion. Um, it's a whole lot of material coming at you. So hopefully that will be up today or tomorrow. I'll give you a couple of days on it to work on it, but it is going to be accredited assignment. So participate in that and essentially she'll ask a couple of questions you will have to reply and then you'll have to reply to a couple other students. So if you've done online discussions, that's the way it's going to go. Um, any questions about any of that before I get started on unit four? Everybody feeling okay? Counting down to Friday? I'm counting down to Friday. Spring break couldn't come soon enough, although I know it's going to be gone before we even know it. Um, all right, so we move back into the environment theme. The environment theme, and this lecture is entitled The Great Unleashing, 1939 to 1969. I wanted to, well, first we'll locate ourselves. So we're in the first unit of, or rather, the first lecture of Unit 4, The Great Unleashing. We're covering, that goes a little early, 34, but really it should be 39 um, to 60. Nine, so about 30 years from the start of World War II um, right up to the dawn of 1970. Um, and then this is the first of the four for this last unit. This last unit, unit four that we're dealing with, is called a war economy. Just to kind of give you the big framing of it. And one of the theses of it is that we never really left World War II in a lot of really important ways. And we'll see that in multiple ways as we move through this unit. I wanted to remind us though first where we've been and what these units, what these lecture themes are about. You've got this slide from way back at the beginning um, but when we're talking about the environment, so that environment theme, we just want to remember that we're thinking about four interrelated variables. Um, the first is just thinking about the space itself that's imagined as the nation, that's imagined within the nation, that's of the nation's concern geography and space in fact really makes a difference um, in, in, in history in particular um, and then any conflicts over that space as well and so in our last three units we saw that in various ways um, the natural resources themselves or natural resources that are used in this space so whether we're talking about soils or minerals or rivers or forests waters as we move into this unit we're actually talking about some new synthetic stuff that comes into our environment plastics and synthetic chemicals which are never there before and show up again. Uh, we look at the changing ecological conditions, what happened in those spaces because of the use of the space, 
And then, what kinds of ideas about nature and ourselves, right? And we've done this now three times. And I just want to kind of remind you, and this would be useful for an overview when you get to the, when you start thinking about the final as well. But we started the very first lecture in this class, in Unit 1, Lecture 1, um, was about expansion and industrialization of this huge Western environment, this Western region, in order to benefit economic growth and in order to benefit an Eastern economy that was growing. It was a resource region that came in. It was a land that was seen, land itself was seen as a resource for Americans to benefit from. That's why it was there. In this time period, anything that was public land was soon to be private land. It was intended to be privatized. It was intended to be commercialized. We also notice in this period of time that the land came to take on the spiritual importance for Americans as well. In their imagination, the land was this place where pioneers became citizens, right? Where immigrants became republicans etc. And so it wasn't just the material goods in this exploitation, but the idea of nature became part of the foundation of the modern nation, and really the, the nature's nation came into being um, in this period of time, so the late 19th century. And then you'll remember we moved into Unit 2, Reform 1, or the nationalization of nature in an urbanizing world, where we saw the state hold on to its public land. This was a switch no longer for the first hundred years land is to be given away it's to be commercialized it's to be privatized suddenly the state comes in and says you know what it makes better sense for us to hold on to it we'll hold forest reserves forest reserves so that we can let the timber out at a reasonable sustainable use level instead of having exploited like happened in the east a recognition that the federal government could probably do better at managing those large swaths of land for industry than industry could do for itself, that it could create efficient and productive systems and it could help to enhance the American economy into the 20th century. Lands mostly for timber, for mining, for grazing, but also sublime beauty. We see the national parks emerge in this period of time. Um, national parks are created and they, this land that's supposed to be made wild and it's counterpoised, it's, it's sort of juxtapositioned with this rising urban environment that's also a part of this world. And this urban environment is seen as separate from nature, but in need of reform as well. And so Jane Addams, Alice Paul, others, uh, or rather Alice Hamilton, um, others are going, how do we clean up our city? Um, at the same time, men are out in the, in the public lands protecting the forest. And then finally, the last unit we saw the rise of the environmental management state. These lands become tools for the federal government, for the new welfare state, for the provision of jobs, for the creation of opportunity, uh, for the creation of public power as well. The Bureau of Reclamation and the, uh, and the Newlands Act that brought it into existence, turning rivers into power supplies, the Army Corps of Engineers straightening rivers, building canals, this, the landscape really becomes managed by the federal and by state governments at this point. A lot of it ends up getting its funding first and foremost from the New Deal. And that effort to recover the economy was spent out in our public lands and out in our wild lands. Um, and these rising efforts to manage all of our public lands towards a national growth and towards national development. Um, and this becomes intensified, as I suggested, during the New Deal, um, where we see power regions planned and emerged in Washington and Tennessee. Um, national forests built, campgrounds built, state forests, etc. Roads, schools, airports. Land you might think of in this environmental management state as a tool of power, right? It's certainly the way in which Franklin Roosevelt used public money and public lands, kept him in power for his entire presidency. But that status of the lands being part of the nation state, identity of the nation state, the, the home of the security state, which we're going to see emerge in this period, um, this is all premised on those public lands never anymore becoming public, but becoming the state and the state managing them. Um, and in this unit, where I don't have the title slide pictures in there, um, I'm not going to move it over. The, pic the photo that you had on the title slide 
is of Sputnik. Let me know what Sputnik was. What was Sputnik like? It was like the when the Russians started doing missions in the space. Yeah, first first satellite, first um, artificial satellite in space. So Unit Four, we see space actually appear on our imagination, um, as well as this intensifying use of American nature, both for production and a growing, we thought the 20s were profligate, the 50s were insane in terms of the amount of material that people were consuming. So American nature is space for production, but also ongoing military readiness. And this growing sense that we've got a nation state, but we have a nation state that now has a global presence. And so thinking about the globe and thinking about security on the globe becomes part of the environmental imagination. Um, we see it shift from a command economy of World War II um, that was provisioning World War II soldiers that made the D-Day landing to a rocket ship making it all the way to the moon, landing men safely and flying them back alive. All part of the same expanding imagination. Increase in speed of transportation, increase in speed of airplanes shrinks the globe, but things like radar and the airplanes, satellites, and this growing security surveillance mind, the state itself, becomes the eyes of the world, in a sense. And we're able to see ourselves more than ever. So a genuine and a visual global awareness. We shift from being isolationists in terms of our imagination to global in terms of our imagination. And this connected us to a global material world of unprecedented abundance. We weren't just getting stuff from us, we were getting stuff from all over the globe. So that by the end of this period, about 20% of the world's resources were being 25% of the world's resources are being consumed by the United States, which doesn't have nearly the population to justify that. This consumption comes in new production ways as well, so growing levels of dangerous chemicals in both food and in goods production. So we use the land more intensively and we dirty it in more pernicious ways or difficult to clean up. Um, and in the midst of all of this, there's this really interesting idea that emerges, this idea of American wilderness. And the American Wilderness Bill passes in the early 1960s, preserving the last roadless lands. So we're, we're ruining things on one end worse than ever, but we're also saving things on the other end in ways that nation states have never done. Setting aside wild lands forever, first as a national park, but then as spaces that would never have roads was unprecedented in modern history. Um, so a lot going on in this period. I apologize for the lack of image there. Let's just think about, though, what has just happened, what is in the process of happening as we start this story. There's been a war in Europe. We had put millions, millions of men into Europe and throughout Western Europe, and we had, in the process, decimated part of Germany. So you get millions of Americans with this experience of a European theater telling that experience back to the United States, Europe becomes part of our imagination more than it ever had been before. With the victory, most of the fighting forces come home, but not all of them, because we gotta figure out the relationships in this theater. We gotta figure out how to put Europe back on its feet. It's been decimated uh, by six years of just intense warfare. Um, Germany would sign the peace treaty in May of 1945, and then we would settle into, in that summer, the Potsdam Conference, um, which was essentially an effort to figure out how to demobilize Europe. How did the Soviets pull out? How did the, how did the United States pull out? How do we set these nations back on their feet? Um, United States is sitting in this, around this table settling Europe. It's also, at the same time, still fighting a war in the Pacific. A war that would still last a few more months. Um, finishing the island campaign, I talked about this last time, moving in close to Japan, um, trying a firebombing campaign to see if that would buckle the knees of the Japanese, and then ultimately culminating in the use of nuclear weapons um, and ending the war so by August 10th 
word is come, had come that the Japanese were surrendering, and by September 2nd, we had the emperor aboard the USS Missouri, where he signed the papers for unconditional surrender. And so by September, it's over, but we've got forces all over the Pacific as well, and you might just notice as we grab, it's, it's a little different than Germany. Germany, you can grab a big swath of territory out in the Pacific. You have to hold island after island after island. So we're spread thin across the Pacific. But a whole group of American men, millions as well, who hadn't ever seen the Pacific, become familiar with the Pacific Islands and Japan and China as well. Um, and so we settle down into how are we going to make this work? How are we going to put all of this together? The Russians had not got involved in Japan. The Soviets had not, but the Soviets had been critical to the fight in Europe. And in Europe, things deteriorated fairly, fairly quickly. Um, first, Truman and Truman did not trust Stalin. Stalin thought Truman was no, he was no Roosevelt. Was kind of the way Stalin would put it. Um, but Stalin was also not interested in moving his troops out of Eastern. Europe. He had lost millions of soldiers and he had advanced all the way into Germany. The defeat of Germany really was done by the Soviets, not by the United States. Um, and he was part of a communist nation, right? And what's the goal of communism? Okay, where? At the bottom. But where spatially? Where is that going to happen? Who's going to be equal where? Global? I mean, yeah, well, so that's the communist ambition. Is not a Soviet state, it's not a Cuba, it's an entire global world that is communist. That's the vision itself. And so Stalin's coming from the Soviet Union, which has really become this expansive empire. It's not just Russia. It's moving outward, it's moving outward, and in order for it to expand its influence, it needs other nation states that are also communists, that are also participating in this situation. 1946, Greek falls into a civil war. Why does Greek fall into a civil war? Because it had been occupied by the Germans and the Italians, and throughout the entire war, when they pulled out, they left a political vacuum. In that political vacuum, they were pro-capitalists, in the nation state who held the government itself and there were communist fighters who wanted to turn Greek communist and it descended into a civil war which put the United States on edge there's suddenly this war in Europe as they're trying to settle things a civil war in Greek Greece itself I told you Tr uh, Truman did not trust Stalin he suspected that Stalin had something to do with what was going on in Greece um, Stalin didn't. This was not a Soviet supported thing. It was supported only by Yugoslavia. But the guns that Yugoslavia were using were guns that had come from the Soviets. So it appeared as if they were support for Stalin in the Greek Civil War. The United States turns around and says, well, we can't leave these things be. And they start funneling arms to the government. We're going to protect Greece. We're going to stop Greece from turning communist under our watch here in Europe, and their funds were enough to stave off and hold Greek democratic, keep it a capitalist state. Uh, but it also raised this specter, um, particularly within the State Department, and the most famous articulation of it came from George Kennan, which was this realization that they maybe pulling back wasn't going to work so well, that we were in a world where there was this other nation state that was at permanent war with us. That was in their founding documents. And so George Kennan wrote a number of letters in 1946 to 47, which were then published as the sources of Soviet conduct in 1947. And he said the Soviet and communists um, are, have declared war on capitalism. They've declared war on freedom. They've declared that they don't want a world that includes us. And they seek to accomplish this by taking territory, by seeing states that aren't already communist become communist, and then linking them into the Soviet empire. So they're going to take them country by country. 
And, and uh, Kennan said, you know, when we look at Greece, Greece nearly went communist because it had communist states on every side of it. Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, etc. When countries are close to communist countries, they put at risk the freedom of the nearby countries, Kennan said. But he said, we can't go to war with the Soviets. Like, we just finished the world war. The last thing we can do is decide to declare war on our allies. But, he said, we can't let communism grow anymore either, because it's a threat to our material existence. Um, and so he came up with the policy of containment, which is to say, we keep it where it is. It's in the Soviet Union, it's in a couple of those Eastern European countries. We stop it there, we don't let it go any further. And that became our official policy. Um, through that policy, the National Security Act of 1947 set the Central Intelligence to work. Central Intelligence Agency was the first international spy agency. It was, a, it was designed specifically to deal with the threat of communism, to put spies in places where there is a risk that a government or an economy might turn communist and to do whatever we could to stop that from happening. Right? This is the decided policy. Sometimes that meant supporting rebels. Sometimes that meant putting in arms. Sometimes that meant creating false propaganda. But we were going to actively contain communism. We're not going to let it spread any further. Um, and so as I said, this led to the creation of the CIA and really the beginning of this surveillance security face of the United States, right? This idea that we look everywhere and we, in a sense, have a right to look everywhere and pay attention to everything, lest we be at risk. You have to understand all of this in the wake of a world war that was just horrific, right? Things happened under people's noses in the 1930s. This is an effort to stop those things from happening again um, and setting the world right. Um, and so essentially we go into the monitoring of political conditions and interfering in political campaigns um, mode starting in 1947. Um, 1948, the first sort of major exposure that there might be trouble in the United States State Department. Um, Alger Hiss was accused by Whitaker Chambers of selling him secrets from the State Department in 1938. Um, yeah, July 48. Um, one of the kind of important sides for this hearing was, you, you recognize who that is? Nixon. Richard Nixon. So he would become president in 1968. Richard Milhouse Nixon is a young freshman House member on the HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee, who said he didn't, his came in and said, they're lying, they're lying, they're lying. Um, Nixon said, now we can't believe him. Um, he probably did it. His gets a little bit of time for it. It's never really clear until the Soviet Union falls and the archives are open up and it turned out that his was indeed a spy for the Soviet Union. Uh, but this was in question until those archives opened. Um, but it's raising the specter that within our State Department we have communists that we can't even trust internally. We don't know who to trust. And it is a truism that a number of the people who were participants in the New Deal were members of the Communist Party. It, was, it wasn't as frightening as it would become in the Cold War. Um, and so there were people that, that the Congress was pointing at and saying, we don't want them in our government because of the values that they hold. Um, the response to the Greece crisis and the response to the uncertainty of what we do in Europe and the threat of the Soviets to stay led to this enormous investment between 1948 and 1952, and this was called the Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan provided 18, I'm sorry, 15 billion dollars in U.S. financing, and you can see how it spread out. Britain got the most of it, France got the second most, Germany, who had just defeated, gets the third most, Italy, who had just defeated, gets the fourth most. But we're going after the industrialized, developed, most developed nations, providing them with money, financing, to spend on us and our goods. Almost all of that $15 billion was spent on American goods and American development. 
right? So this was essentially an investment in ourselves, um, using American dollars and American goods and American know-how to rebuild Europe, but also to fight communism. This is part of the idea here, is we don't have another, let's see, we gave money to Greece as well, we don't have another Greece situation. We don't allow a country to fall into such despair that it's got civilians or it's got uh, um, people fighting for um, communism in the state itself. Um, and, and this idea was, let's rebuild Europe. Let's get it back on its feet. It had been decimated. Um, so 1948, this process gets underway. 1949, summer of 1949, probably the worst for the State Department in history. They learned that on August 29th, the Soviet Union had uh, detonated a fat man style bomb. That's a plutonium trigger. That's the more complicated of the two technologies. It was pretty clear to anyone who knew anything about nuclear weapons that they could not have invented this on their own. The Soviets have been working on nuclear technology since the 30s. They hadn't gotten very far. It was clear to anybody who knew that somebody stole the plans for the fat man bomb, the plutonium trigger, the more complicated trigger, and they were able to put it together. Um, but this is the scare of the his case. This is the fear, right? We can't trust our State Department. We can't trust our secrets. Our secrets are, sneak, are sneaking out to the Soviet Union. Um, more importantly, though, what this showed and what this began was an arms race, okay? This was a new logic. This was the logic of the Cold War itself. It meant that what, what Stalin was saying here was instead of sitting down and negotiating with you about eliminating nuclear weapons, we're going to play a game of let's see who can have more, right? Um, so you don't sit and negotiate. You go, I'm going to build an arsenal as big as your arsenal. So the United States has two bombs. Soviet Union makes two bombs. So the United States makes two more bombs. Soviet Union makes two more bombs. These things are not cheap. They're not mass produced, right? But they start this arms race. Who's going to have more of them? You make four, we make four. You make six, we make six. And it goes on. Right now we're standing at 7,000 to 7,000. That's how many nuclear warheads. Today, this minute, are facing us and we have facing the Soviet Union. It's a logic though. So the logic is, well, we're not going to get rid of these things. How are we going to manage them? I'm only going to find a piece of chalk, probably not. Um, awesome. How are we going to manage this if we can't decide the other guy's going to go? Well, so we build the weapons. They build weapons. It keeps going up. Until... There's enough so that both sides can kill the other side completely. That a retaliatory strike, so it's, and, and it is game theory logic that says it is so, it would be so overwhelmingly destructive for the United States to start a war that it won't start one. That it would be because we would get, by the time our missiles landed, those other missiles would be coming. And the same is true for the Soviet Union. That because we're both fully armed and capable of destroying the other, we won't do it. That's been the logic of nuclear standoff since this period of time. That was what was decided. We've had a couple of times where we, re where we have reduced some weapons but we still stand at a nuclear standoff. That's our situation with the Russians even today. That there's so much firepower, it won't actually happen, Joe. Is that because there's so much um, leftover tension with Russia or 
Because I mean, the Soviet Union obviously. Yeah. Soviet Union. Well, so what is the geopolitical? It's a little confusing in the last five or six years. Yeah. Who's our friend? Who's our enemy? Which side are we on? Are they it's just easier to keep it the way it was? Is it was a lot. I will say, when the Cold War ended in 1989, it was very confusing and disorienting for most of us who grew up with it, because it was much simpler when there were the bad guys and the good guys. We were the good guys. The communists were the bad guys. That was it. The world was divided in that way. Um, it's that way still because we are still in a cold war. We still have uh, we still have tensions. We still have parts of the globe that maybe we'd want, they want. You think about Afghanistan, for example, other spaces. And so there's been no decision to shut it down, right? And mm, maybe opportunities, but certainly they haven't been taken. This has been, and MAD is the acronym, MAD, because it's MAD crazy. But the other thing about it is it's worked. It's worked. There hasn't been a nuclear war. All these weapons. There hasn't been a nuclear war. Nobody's used a nuclear weapon since the United States blew the two up. And uh, nobody's used it in warfare since then. Right now, there's a whole lot of fear now that some of this will get out to terrorists. Someone will take a, 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 a briefcase into Manhattan and blow up Manhattan. Something along those lines. But that technology isn't out there. What we have is bomb technology, and states hold it, and the states that hold it are facing off against each other in this, you kill us, we'll kill you, everybody will be dead. Let's avoid that type of situation. So as crazy as it sounds, when you run the game theory on it, game theory is actually a logic of statistics and numbers, it works, and it has worked. So if you're going to have nuclear weapons, this may be the way to do it. Um, but this locked down Europe. That was it. The United States was not leaving at that point. The United States instead was digging in. It was putting a base in Germany. It was staying put. It was allying, creating NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it was saying, we are going to stand off against this nuclear force, the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet Union drops its Iron Curtain. Um, and so in Yugoslavia, you can see it slightly on the other side of it. Here's Greece down here. Greece, except for Turkey, was surrounded by communist states. The Iron Curtain is essentially no economic movement between this, and that hadn't been the case in the beginning. Right? When the Soviet Union first had its revolution, Henry Ford was invited in. He was building factories for them. They welcomed American technology. This was a brand new stance towards the Americans. We don't want any part, and we, we are essentially at war with you. Kennan was right. This was an effort to expand and expand their reach. Um, so the Soviets, what do they want? They want a centrally planned communist economy within their sphere. They want the world to become communist. And the United States and Western Europe are protecting free market capitalism, free market exchange, and industrial competition. And this becomes this sort of spatial standoff in the world, right? And then if this wasn't worrisome enough, 1949 was a terrible year. The Chinese Civil War ends. It had been going on since the end of the war as well. The vacuum left behind by the removal of Japanese forces left the Civil War in place. Part of that Civil War was led by Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, who led communist forces and succeeded in defeating the Chinese government and affecting a communist takeover in China with a communist victory. Um, so, <clears throat> so containment. <laughs> Containment's not going so well by the time the 50s start, in fact. By 1950, like almost all of Asia is under communist control. And this encouraged the stay puttedness of the military on this side of Asia as well. So bases in Japan, bases in the Philippines, and a permanent standing military presence in the West Pacific as well. Um, and it encouraged increasing CIA presence and military control in Latin America as well. South America, there's some concern by 1950. Argentina is under an authoritarian government that might be communist, certainly sympathetic. Bolivia as well, as well as throughout Indonesia. 
Um, there are communist rulers. They're not all aligned with the Soviet Union uh, yet. Um, so five years after World War II had ended, five years after we had sort of defeated the Nazis, we're suddenly standing there looking at this expansive empire in Asia, the spread of communism and this threat to the American way of life. Um, such a threat that even teeny tiny pieces of freedom and land became important. Anybody know what that is? Korea. Korea. Yes, that little tiny Korean peninsula hanging out there between Japan and China. Um, anything, any movement. So by 1950, like, okay, now we're serious. We're not going to let this expand. Um, and in 1950, that just, that thing exactly happens in Korea. Communist forces moved down from the north to take over South Korea, all the way down, almost took the entire peninsula. Uh, Truman went to the UN, so he didn't act on his own, he asked the UN to be part of a military force, which was 90% US forces, and we went to war in South Korea. Five years after these, the uh, World War II has ended, we're back at war again, and a whole new group of men and soldiers are called in to protect free markets, to protect freedom in South Korea. Um, the UN forces, mostly the US, would press the communist forces all the way to the border of China, and then they would back, back out to the armistice line, um, the DMZ. This war never ended. There's an armistice. The Korean War is still, we are still at war with North Korea. Um, some of the visits from the recent president were a little shocking given the fact that we're still officially at war and there's just a neutral zone sitting between the two countries. Uh, but this was, okay, we're going to stop it. We're not going to let communism expand any further. It was a three-year war um, and a number of veterans from World War II went, found themselves back out at war again. Throughout the 50s and 60s, in fact, if we look at Southeast Asia, we could look at Africa as well, it was this tremendous transformation taking place. Africa was decolonized. This meant that European forces, European imperialists, European over-rulers pulled out, and it meant that there were these political vacuums all over Africa, political vacuums all over Southeast Asia, places that had never been nations but that had been colonized by the West in the 19th century, exploited by the West in the early 20th century, were suddenly finding themselves in the middle of the 20th century going, okay, we've got to make a nation state. We've got to create a nation state. Every single one of these new nations presented an opportunity or a risk. And this is how the containment policy approached these things. When the colonial powers left, often by force, there would be some, some uprising that was there to, turn, uh, to, to bring the state under their power. And in every time this would happen, the question would be, are the Soviets influencing this? Is this an effort to bring them into their sphere? And in fact, they were. They were trying to get some of these states to turn communist. And the CIA was in all of these states trying to get the opposite to happen, right? So Cold War between giant states out in these edge regions, hot war, real war, real civil war, real wars being fought with American weapons and Soviet weapons, a proxy war. Who's going to get them? Is the communists going to get them? Is the, are the Americans going to get them? Are they going to be free um, or are they going to be part of the Soviet? Um, over and over and over again in the 50s and the 60s, we see these battles happening um, and these, these hot wars taking place in these marginalized regions. And every single one of them, we see both sides armed with American weapons or Soviet weapons. It was a military complex on both sides that was fueling often the conflicts. Um, by the end of the 1950s, <laughs> kind of looked like the Soviets were taking the lead wasn't looking good at all um, where we started. Sputnik, October 1957, the first artificial Earth satellite. You can go online, you can go onto Wikipedia, you can hear what it did. It goes bing, 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 bing. That's all it does. 
So who cares? This is not a, this is not taking pictures. This is not all it can do. And in fact, it just stayed up in orbit for like three weeks, four weeks, something like that. It was in a low enough orbit that it couldn't stay, and then it burned up and it's gone. It disintegrated when it came back in the atmosphere. So what? Why would we care about this little tiny device? Chantel. It would cause hysteria, like if they can do that, what else can they do? What else could, I mean, the, the bing, bing, bing. Did it bring fear with the nuclear weapons being like easier launch from space and since it's shorter so, distance? Yeah, it wasn't the satellite. It wasn't the satellite. The satellite was just the Soviets going, you know what we got? We got rocket technology. And you know what you can do with rocket technology? You can put warheads on the top of that rocket and fire those rockets over. So it wasn't the Sputnik itself. It was a useless piece of technology. What they showed is they could get into orbit. They could get something into orbit. And if you can get something into low orbit, you can lob it over the horizon and drop it on a continent half a world away. We're suddenly within reach of the Soviet Union. That's the fear here. That's the concern and the driving concern at the end of the 1950s. Um, and then fall, the following year, another loss. 1958, Cuba falls to the communists. Now it wasn't clear actually what Fidel was all about. Fidel was kind of quiet about where he was going to lie, what his political leanings were, etc. Uh, but very quickly he buddies up with the Soviets. And it's clear by 1965 that he's put in place a communist government. Um, but so this is Cuba though. <laughs> so containment, like we're supposed to contain communism and there it is right in our backyard. Like we got satellites flying around, they got rockets on us, we got communists showing up right off the coast of Florida. Now we have a standing military base, Guantanamo Bay on Cuba. We will not give it up, even with the revolution. We continue to hold it. We maintain that base and been there since the Spanish-American War of 1898. And like I said, it wasn't entirely clear what Castro was going to do. But we would very quickly find out. Um, and then the following year, Back in Southeast Asia, trouble starts to brew in this French colony. Um, French Indochina, what would eventually be Vietnam. Starting in 1959, the French began to be attacked by a northern communist group, the northern Vietnamese, who were trying to take back the South, who were trying to create a whole nation that had been broken in part by colonialism, also supported by the Russians and by the communists. We first start just sending aid, like, okay, this is French colonies, we'll help them out. Uh, but by the early 1960s, we're also sending intelligence and men, soldiers, and we're starting to fight. We become fully involved by 1965, and we start drafting men to go and fight in Vietnam in 1966. Containment, like we lost Cuba, we're not going to lose this. This is all happening in a world where we are at risk in our perception, a world where the, where the Russians are pressing in on us. Um, the genuine risk of the Cold War hit home in 1962. And so not only was it bad that Cuba, Cuba became communist, but in 1962, we got intelligence, airplanes flying overhead, took pictures, the Soviets were building missile launching bases on Cuba that could easily hit the United States. Um, detected, like I said, with spy planes. Our immediate reaction, so there's John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy was the eternal attorney general. John Kennedy was the president. What do we do? What do we do? It's a nuclear standoff. Like, this is the closest we ever came to a nuclear war. And these brothers had to deal with that. Um, they first sent warships out and they just surrounded the Cuba. I mean, surrounded Cuba. They said, we're not going to let the boats Russian boats land, we're not going to let this go on. The Soviets were appalled. Kennedy then goes on television. So on, on October 22nd, 1962, he goes on and he makes a national address and he says, we're on the brink of a nuclear war. He shows the photographs 
here's what's happened. The Soviets are building weapons right in their own backyard, and we have said we're not going to let it happen. We're going to, we're going to prevent it from happening. He went on the news on October 22nd and said we're not going to happen. You see when it ended, October 28th. Americans lived for six days not sure whether or not a nuclear war was about to explode. It was about to happen all around them. Six days, right? That was the risk. Like, you just didn't know. People were stocking their bomb shelters. People were planning for something to happen. They expected this. Because why would the Russians stop at this, at this point? And we were feeling relatively weak. This seemed like a battle that we were losing. Um, if, in fact, you looked at the numbers from 1962 to 1967, you see an increasing decline in multi-party democracies, which is the blue, which is what we're aiming for, right? Multi-party democracies were getting smaller, were shrinking. Um, from a global perspective, the Cold War was being lost. China in 1950, Cuba 19. 58, several African and South American states as well had gone communist, Central American states as well. And then in the middle of the 60s, we see this decrease in multi-party democracies. Um, now Kennedy's gone, right? Kennedy gets assassinated in 1963, so most of this happens under Johnson. Um, but the Cold War seemed, at least in its first two decades, to leave the United States back on its heels. Um, it seemed like we weren't ever getting ahead of this thing until 1968. So there's another look at the Cold War. Um, so Kennedy, when he was elected, had actually put this challenge out there to get ahead of the Russians. This is just a snippet from his acceptance address, um, but he connects the space program to the Cold War. Right? The great battleground for the defense and expansion of freedom is the whole south half of the globe, Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, lands of the rising people. These are the new nation states where we're fighting with the Soviet Union for control. But we go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. So if the Soviets are doing it, so are we. That's what that statement means, and it is a most important decision. Um, he talks about the importance of space, and then he says, this century, we should go to the moon. Uh, rather, this decade, before the decade is out. Unprecedented, right? Unheard of. Um, but he does it. He launches the Apollo program. So these are all of the Apollo rockets. This is what the, actually, before this, we had the Mercury program, but the Apollos are the impressive rockets that get you to the moon. Three-stage Saturn V rockets that would ultimately get men off of the Earth, out of orbit, to the moon, into orbit of the moon, land them, and then bring them back safely. In the unprecedented human expansion, unprecedented technological move. Most of it done on chalkboards and calculators. I don't know if you guys have seen the movies about that. Um, so we send, first. the first makes it to orbit, to, to the orbit of the Earth. So we catch up to Sputnik in 1966. That's when we, we get the Saturns up there. Um, and then we get to the moon and back with the Apollo 8. This is one of the first photographs of the Earth from space. Um, so Apollo 8, December 21st, 1968, it's nearly at the moon. You can see Baja, California there. Now imagine this photograph is being taken by one of the three men in the first rocket ship to leave Earth's orbit. He's looking back at Earth on his way to the moon when they've never done it before. Like, he doesn't know when he's taking this photograph he's ever getting back there. This is a test run. This is a pilot run. So you can just imagine watching the Earth sort of disappear out the back there. Um, and then I think I've got a, yep, it's going to play. So then on December 24th, so they got to the moon. There's, there's the moon rising. And then on Christmas Eve, on television, the most watched television show in history to this point, 
They broadcast back from the moon. Genesis while you're orbiting the moon on live TV. It's like they're going to a place, like they're somewhere there never been, like that's kind of like God's word. They're God. Pretty much, we're God's people, basically, is what they were trying to get. So if this is not a claim of divinity, yeah. I don't know what is. And this is part of how this whole conflict was seen, good versus evil. Right? Now we've gotten to the moon, why not read Genesis? Wasn't like the communist view on a religion like anti-religion? Yeah, they believed it was the opiate of the masses and they outlawed it. So you were only allowed to worship the state. That was it. The state was to be your religion. So reading a religious text from... In your face. Yeah. The atheist <laughs> Russia, exactly. <laughs> and it, and it's, it's very much a statement about we're God's chosen people. This is a new beginning. Right? This is after this Cold War. Here we are at the moon, however. And we made it to orbit the moon. There's, there's footage of this whole, the Apollo 8 took all kinds of camera footage. They sent a lunar lander down almost to land and then they pulled it back up. They ran the whole landing as if, but they didn't have a person in it. So it was a full dry run and they got video of the whole thing. And this was the first time guys have been to the moon, right? And, and then made it back as well. Um, and that becomes an iconic photograph, that picture of Earth rising, right? You now have the whole world visually in your hand, right? Um, you can see the, the, the entirety of it. And it's a kind of power move. Both of the pictures of Earth that were sent by the United States were partly saying, look, we can see the whole thing. We can see it all at once, and we can do so with an advanced technology. Um, so, we're looking at a world at this point in time, get up to, we look at us at, at 1969, where the communists hold a huge chunk of contiguous territory and appear to be expanding and intention, intending to expand. Um, they have positioned their military in the balance to ours. Oops. So there's our military presence, right? So we're, we've got this global presence that's designed to contain the Soviets and looks at it as a, as a challenge of containment. Um, and the U.S. has taken on this brand new role, this role that we've had since World War II. We are now the policemen. Now we'll work with the U.N., we'll work with NATO, but U.N. and NATO don't tell us what to do. We tell U.N. and NATO what to do. Whenever there's an action that we're interested in, it's usually 90% our forces. Um, we tend to dominate, and we spend most of the money in that area, but we do it under an international umbrella. We're the policemen against communist threats, right? That's what we are by 1969. And the, and the political consequences and material outcomes of fighting over national resources. So surveillance and security, that's our, that's our worldview there by the end of the 60s, 
right? That we have areas that we hold that are friendly, we sit in the center, and we have risks from these other territories as well. We have the same reach, we have a broader reach globally than we did during World War II. So we expanded into World War II and then we dug in. We held on to that global presence in large part to maintain control over resources in other parts of the globe. Initially it wasn't oil, but it will become oil. This region becomes super critical. Um, by the 60s and 70s and certainly by the end of the century, um, very much the case. But we have, the globe has become ours. We have expanded globally, we filled out into this space that World War II provided for us, and then we stayed in it. And we continue to have that role today. We spend more money five times over than any other country on the military. And we'll talk about the military um, economy next time. But our goal was not to be caught back on our heels by a group of totalitarian Nazis or fascists like we did in the 1940s and not have to wait two years to be ready to fight. We'll have the fight ready. Or the fight ready for anybody else is ready to go and, and we've maintained this presence. So globally, now let's turn back home and think about our resources at home. Um, characterized as intensification, intense intensification. Um, we can go out into the farm field where we see an increase in chemical use in agriculture, particularly um, following World War II. So you can see the numbers start to go up. The green is the herbicide through the 50s into the 60s. Pesticides and herbicides synthetically made, which means that on the one end, these things are being poured all over our agricultural land. Little factoid about insecticides. Before insecticides were in widespread use, farmers lost about 11% of their crop to insects. Since insecticides have been in widespread use, farmers lose about 10% of their crops to insects. We're not sure what they're doing out there exactly, but they're using more and more and more of them. And why would that be the case? More pesticides than ever, same loss to insects. They become immune. Immune? To the chemicals. How can they do that? Mutation. Mutation. Yeah, so basically it's an evolution experiment. Insects are reproducing like crazy. One insect survives because they're immune to the pesticide. They breed and suddenly you get a field full of pesticide resistant insects. We have been building more and more and more intense pesticides to try to keep them at bay, but we're just making better insects. And they keep they just keep learning because they evolve faster than <coughs> we can make chemicals. <coughs> but chemicals became a solution. Chemicals became an idea of hygiene, in fact. So we look at these things spraying in the post-environmental world and we see spray is toxic and dirty, but in the 1950s, you could be sprayed with DDT while you're swimming in the, in the local swimming pool or you were at the beach. These are DDT sprays because DDT was considered a, a miracle chemical. That it didn't seem to have any real harm on people, but it kills everything. In fact, it probably saved millions of lives in World War II. Almost no question about it. Killing mosquitoes, killing insects, etc. So it's all over the environment. Chemicals, in a sense, become this sort of modern thing. Like, everybody wants to have chemicals. They want them in their lives. Yeah. I mean, we dropped herbicides in the Vietnam War. Yes, we did. Yes, and so this becomes, these become warfare as well. Agent Orange um, did not recognize the ecological and human health Danger. Well, we kind of knew, but it wasn't it wasn't reflected on until really recently. And we still have Vietnam veterans who were sprayed with this stuff and um, and who have uh, chemical exposure issues. But chemicals everywhere, right? Because we have these new techniques. So the nuclear bomb, building a nuclear bomb and working with matter on that level was just one element of chemistry and physics and the science that was going into being able to make new substances that existed out there. Um, ubiquitous in both places. One of, we also see the rise of plastics, and this was a byproduct of the oil economy. Um, 
So we see it first as a byproduct of organics, and then we see synthetic catalytic processes for creating plastics as well. They are just chains of molecules um, that all kind of string out very long and allow for the flexibility that you get from the plastic. The first of the plastics was actually styrofoam. That made Dow Chemicals reputation. It was just an insulation, but then you realize you can use it for cups and you can mold it into other things. And slowly but surely, um, more and more consumer plastics began to emerge to wrap vegetables, to make picnic gear out of, to make cups and saucers and plates, and then increasingly for manufacturing as well. So bit by bit in the 1950s and 60s, plastic began to replace wood and glass and metal and leather and a whole host of traditional organic material that had been part of human material culture forever. Piece by piece, plastic's cheaper, it's easier, it's faster, and it's amazing stuff. It's amazing stuff. It's a combination of moldability, you can shape it in all sorts of ways. Material science around plastics now is unbelievable what they can make. Um, and it's incredibly durable. Once you've made it, it doesn't break down. Um, in fact, so incredibly durable, you can think about this, we started making plastics in the 1930s, except where plastic might have been put through a recycling process, all the plastic that was ever made is still out there in the environment. All of it. Some of it's floating in the oceans and these huge gyres, but it does not break down. It breaks into these beads and it stays persistent in the environment. We won't figure that out for quite some time. It is a miracle substance in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, we'll take a closer look at families in a couple of weeks, but another change in the landscape um, was the change in human habitation. And so we see people wanting to get out of cities, wanting to move out of cities, and we see a, a growing middle class that is desiring this. And so this middle class is actually in this interesting way seeking the rural farm landscape without any of the work. They want to milk cows, or tend chickens, or cut hay, or pick corn, but they want green, they want trees, um, and suburbia is ultimately the answer for that. Farming without the work, the farming landscape, or the pastoral landscape without the work. And in the 40s, and the 50s, and the 60s, Americans flocked to the suburbs. America became suburban. Um, Mass-produced houses were being set out across the landscape and Americans were moving from urban apartments to full-scale houses themselves. Mass-produced houses filled with all of the latest goods in cities around the United States. We see this happen. All of the major cities were at one point surrounded by farmland. All of that farmland became suburbs. And if you been down to Columbus and you watch what happened there around the Beltway, same thing happened there. Suburbs, suburbs, suburbs out from the cities themselves. Um, and each of these houses then required its own, so you move from the apartment to the house, you're talking about more space, but you're also talking about more goods, your own supply of household goods. So they want, middle class Americans want this rural landscape and they want all the stuff of modernization. And each individual house, if you think about it, needs its own supply of all the things that go in that house. So this large house needs bathrooms, it needs bedroom sets, it needs dining sets, it needs televisions, it needs refrigerators, it needs stoves, it needs a car, it needs a lawnmower, everything individualized for the house. So suburbanization becomes this economic engine as well, as people individually fill up their suburban spaces with increasingly more stuff, increasingly more stuff. And we see the volume of household goods grow exponentially in this period of time. It's grown again in my lifetime. Um, the kind of, like, people only had one television when I was a kid and it sat in the living room. I don't know any house that has fewer than four at this point. People only had one telephone when I was a kid. Now everybody's got their own telephone. A computer was a rarity when I was a kid. If you had one, you were like, special. Now, if you don't have one, there's something wrong with you, right? So the ubiquity of stuff has grown again. It started first, though, with the suburban houses in the 1950s. And all of this, remember back, all of this tracks back to nature somewhere. It's all this material production. Some of it no longer coming from the United States, but coming from some of the nations that we have some influence over. 
modern suburbs are actually an answer and a solution to what America's really loved, which was the automobile. They were made possible by the automobile, and they really are a structure that is this technology first. You really have no concept of suburbs until you have a car. So the car makes the suburb, and, the, and then the car becomes ubiquitous. Um, the, one of the things that's, so when Ford first came out with the, the Model T, he said you can have it in any color you want as long as it's black. That was it, he made one model, and he punched it out over and over and over again. By the 1950s, auto manufacturers are realizing they can put out new models every single year to stimulate demand. That this isn't a one-time purchase, but this might be a four or five-time purchase in your lifetime. And so you see the automobile become the symbol of middle-class life itself. Um, and automobility itself was then sanctioned by the state in the mid-1950s with Eisenhower's interstate highway system. And this was a $114 billion construction project, mostly paid for by the federal government, um, built in some places where state roads already existed and other places where they didn't, but this was a civil defense network. This was designed so that if there was a war in the United States, we could get our military where we needed to get it as quickly as we can. It also became the infrastructure of the modern market. The number of trucks now that run over these things with your goods coming off of ships from China is almost uncountable. Um, and so the Federal Highways Act of 1956 creates the interstate system, which isn't completed until the mid-90s when I-90 was finished in northern Idaho. I was actually there for that. Um, so 40 years of development and growth, most of it went up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, back in the suburbs for a minute. So Adam Rome was a historian of suburbanization, environmental historian of suburbanization, said there was also this really common and unusual experience of suburban kids in the 1950s and the 1960s. Because of the speed with which suburbs grew, almost every child lived in a neighborhood that edged on farmland or edged on a forest, and they grew up going to that wild place. Like they lived in the suburbs, but they had a place in the woods, or they had a creek they could go to. They had some nature spot that they had enjoyed. And sometime during their childhood, almost invariably, more suburban development went up into that space that was theirs. And so child after child after child had this experience of their nature disappearing from them in their childhood. And it was a rare and a new kind of experience that seemed to be centered in the suburbs themselves. But 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old, these kids in the 50s and 60s turn around and the place where their fort was is now somebody's front yard. And there's a new road cut through it. And so there was this experience in their childhood of moving to this vast space and then having nature disappear and having natural things disappear. And we see that emerge um, in their consciousness in the 1970s. Um, but it's at that point just something that they experienced. Land, loss of nature because of land use. People building things up around them. So automobility makes this possible. Automobility also made the cities worse as well. So our urban centers um, become increasingly laden with smog. This is both the increase in industry and chemicals being used, but it's also mostly the exhaust of the automobile, which puts out hydrocarbons, which interact with the air and create a toxic smog. In 1948, Denora, Pennsylvania, 20 people died from the toxic smog. These things can get really bad at times. Um, but like in China today, American cities were choked in smog through the 1950s and 1960s, and it just seemed to get worse. Um, the price of progress was often what people called it. It was actually the result of demographics. So by 1970, by 1969, 75% of Americans live in cities or suburbs surrounding cities. We are an urbanized nation at this point, and almost everybody owns an automobile. And almost every one of those automobiles is spewing in, in, incomplete combustion out into the atmosphere itself. Um, 
So there are, in the 50s and the 60s, with all this happening, no regulations at all. No regulations about air pollution, no regulation about water pollution. There was one water law, but it wasn't very strong uh, from 1948. No real concern about it at all. Um, at the same time, we see the impacts right. growing. So car ownership is up to 80%, um, moving towards 90%. We're at about 100% now, I think, in the United States. So there was this sort of growing, 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 growing output of really nasty stuff into the environment and nothing to be done about it, right? That was just the cost of doing business, the price of progress itself. Um, now, a couple bright spots, 1956, the Bureau of Reclamation put together a plan for Colorado and Utah that said, we're gonna build dams in all these various places to create public power, create irrigation, to create development. One of them was slated for the um, Echo Park, which was part of Dinosaur Monument. It was a protected area. And just like in 1908 with Hetch Hetchy, the conservationists say, well, it's a good use of this land. And the preservationists say, keep your hands off. Unlike Hetch Hetchy, the preservationists won in the 1950s. Um, and so, this, it was beginning to show that these suburbanites had different ideas about nature than perhaps earlier in the century. They might be willing to drive their car everywhere, they might be willing to tear up farmland to build a house, they might be willing to put plastics and DDT and, te and pesticides in their houses, but when it came to American nature, they were willing to protect it. Right? When it came to the last natural places in the country, this growing suburban middle class seemed more inclined than any before to leave it be, to let it be. Um, and so we see their political power emerging in the mid-1960s, or mid-1950s, and by the end of that decade, in the early 1960s, Gifford Pincha, I mean, uh, Aldo Leopold, you may remember from the second unit lecture on the environment, who had rebelled against automobiles with a group of other people, created the Wilderness Society, written an idea of wilderness, and argued that the United States needed to create a Wilderness Act to preserve lands as roadless forever. 1964, his dream comes true. Now, Leopold left us in 1948. He died in a, in a prairie fire, um, choked and suffocated, so he didn't make it to the bill being signed. There's. Lyndon B. Johnson um, signing the Wilderness Act, and every single one of those dark green spots on the map are federally protected wilderness. A road can never be built on any of those lands. Uh, a timber cannot be cut on any of those lands. There is one activity, one activity alone that's allowed on wilderness. Can you guess? Cutting Besides grass. recreation. Cutting the grass? Nope. goes back to what we do all the time. Camping? No, well you can camp, so you can go in, and the, the, the ethic of the wilderness is leave only footprints, take only pictures. Like you're not even supposed to take things off of the land at all, but you can go in and camp. You can take a mule train in and camp if you want to, but you can't take a vehicle in or only trail. The only thing that's grandfathered into these wilderness areas is mining. Mining. If, met, if you go on a backcountry trip and you find metals, make a claim. You're still you're under the 1872 mining law. You can actually mine in these areas, but it's the only thing that's allowed in them. Um, so no road whatsoever in any of those areas. And in this period, the 50s and the 60s, these some of the wealthiest of the middle class start this outdoor adventure thing that starts to go on out west. Whitewater rafting, among whitewater rafting becomes huge in the 1950s and 1960s. These bored middle class kids who want to go and risk their lives floating down a river, following John Wesley Powell's path to the Grand Canyon, etc. So we see an intensification of outdoor risk activities, outdoor recreation as well. Um, 1968 though, so let's kind of creep through the last couple of years leading up to the end of this lecture, which is 1969. 68, generals have been saying we're winning Vietnam. New Year's Day, 68, the Tet Offensive begins. And it's clear that like we're not winning Vietnam. Um, this runs until fall 
Um, it's a horrible setback for the military. More, it's a horrible crush to American morale. Like, this is no longer our Americans supporting this war after the Tet Offensive. Um, Public support wears off. I remember December 24th, 1968, the end of that year, we have Apollo 10 circling the moon, coming back around the moon. And so we've got a triumph at the end of 68 that seems to offset Tet, um, and then a series of environmental disasters which get national attention. So January to February 1969, um, Millions of gallons of oil from an offshore oil rig off the of Santa Barbara kills sea life, kills seabirds, blackens the beaches. Um, absolute disaster, and everybody sees it. So you think about the end of the 1960s, everything's on television. This is no longer second day, third day, fourth day. This is live TV or that night on the news. Um, it made front page news as across, news, newspapers across the country made the national news um, throughout this period, sort of this regular reporting of oil destroying the environment. Um, and then that summer, oh, there it is. nearby here, that's right, a river in Ohio caught fire. For that the Cuyahoga. Now, Cuyahoga, fire, Cuyahoga River had caught fire 25 times in the 20th century. 25 times in the 20th century. But when it caught for the 25th time at the end of 1969, it was a national event. Nobody cared before. But suddenly in 1969, it's the front page of Time magazine. It's the news. A river caught fire. A river caught fire, right? It was, and there's, the, there's what you're looking at on the top of the river. It was just muck. There was no, no water regulations, no land regulations. Industry was just pumping things out the back door and into rivers. There was no control whatsoever. Um, and so 1969, there were these major national TV events about how bad we were treating our environment. And people got very concerned. Um, but we ended the year on a bit of a happy note. Oh, sorry, midsummer, same time that we're burning the river. We're also putting a man on the moon and landing on the moon. And really a remarkable, you take it for granted after the fact, um, a remarkable human achievement. Absolutely um, unprecedented in human life. Um, and really sort of established us as at least having the, the uh, engineering power to do really remarkable things, even though the things we were doing seemed to be messing up our environment, it seemed to be making a mess down on Earth. Um, and the thing that changed most through this whole period, so you think about the U.S. becoming global, you think about this intensification of things, you think about the surveillance culture of the CIA, but more than anything, we became aware of ourselves. Television became a part of life. And so through this period, we're increasingly, so from the 30s to the 70s, increasingly becoming self-conscious because we're seeing our events on television. We're seeing live images of these things. And by the 1970s, mostly color TV as well. Now, if you've watched an old color TV, you know the color's crappy. But for the 70s, it was amazing to see things in color. So the world was coming into our living room, and we were able to see more of it than ever before. A um, couple of maps of density, so this is 1940, we started in 1939, this is 1970. So 1940, 1970, you can see just massive urbanization that takes place. Um, and then again, back to this huge footprint. The United States is going to be a military presence. It's going to be a presence for a couple of values, the value of capitalism, the value of free market, the value of democracy. They're going to be at war with the communists until the communists fall. There's this global vision that emerges, though. And with that global vision and the ability to see more, comes more responsibilities as well, which fall our way. Um, just one last thing. 
So this is the map of the wilderness and some of the BLM land. You might just think about the idea of nature having reified itself by 1970 such that anything on that that's dark green or that's green and that's a park, that's where nature was. Everywhere else, nature wasn't. Right? And so in many ways, by the late 20th century, in terms of our space, we've saved nature. And then those other places, Cuyahoga River, for example, beaches in Santa Barbara, those aren't nature. Those are places of production. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. If you didn't get your exam yet, uh, Damina, Raymond, Zachary. That was the uh, intro to Nature Lake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, destroy the flats. Probably a good thing. It's the first one. It's cool up here now. Yeah. Raven? Yeah. I also have. Yeah, really. I've never been there. Thank you. Yeah, he's banking the flats. I'll put it down the library. And then you can get your lunch and whatever. All right. <laughs>